My guest today has visited all seven continents, yes, including Antarctica. She's been on three U.S. talk shows. Well, in the audience. She's a data research nerd, an all-around wonderful human being, who happens to have hosted this host on her podcast, Happier at Work. That's right, today I'm talking to Eva O'Brien. I'm Aiden Nepom, and this is The Changed Podcast. Brian, thank you for joining me on The Changed Podcast. Thanks so much for inviting me, Aidan. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to talk with you. Uh, we had such a wonderful conversation on the Happier at Work podcast, and I think there's so um, there's so much for people around change and workplace that it felt like a good idea to bring you on. But the truth is that I bring all kinds of people on from all walks of life. And I had such a lovely conversation with you. I wanted I wanted to have you come tell a story. So thanks. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, so enjoyed our conversation. And so, you know, it's an absolute pleasure to be on the other side of the mic, let's say, this time <laughs> around, being the one answering the questions rather than asking the questions. <laughs> I, you know, it reminds me of when I was a kid and my favorite shows would have crossover episodes, like oh, yes. a cast of one sitcom <laughs> yeah. show up on another sitcom. To me, it's like that. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember those. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I did not realize until you sent me your um, information that you've been to Antarctica. So I don't I know if have. that's the story you're planning to tell. And if it is, I'll hold off. But if it's not, I, I want to know about it. It's not the story I'm planning to tell, um, although it might be slightly, it might be, you know, slightly related in a way. Um, but yeah, what would you like to know? Um, what were you doing there? Was it as cold as they say? Do, uh, do they really have like a, a poop slicing operation? I know that that sounds kind of graphic and disgusting, but I, I was fascinated by it. <laughs> That's what I've heard because they have, there's no like waste treatment like everything is frozen and then sliced and then disposed oh. of in some way I, I don't really I haven't heard I may, that well I may <laughs> edit this out but <laughs> <laughs> I went there as part I I went there as part of a larger trip let's say so I spent around six months traveling around uh, South America and had an absolute blast and I lived in Australia for a time when I was in Australia there was an opportunity to take a flight. I think it was one of those, you know, those Groupon deals. It was an uh -huh. opportunity to take a flight over Antarctica, which I thought, oh, that sounds amazing. I think it was 900 Australian dollars. Um, it seemed like a bargain. I think on the way out, you sit at the window and on the way back, you sit in the, the aisle or you switch with someone. And it, when I went to book it, it was all sold out. Um oh which is kind of good in a way because then when the opportunity came up when I was traveling around South America and Antarctica was definitely high up there on my list when I went to to South America and I arrived in Ushuaia which is where you you depart from and uh, prior to that I think it, it must have been prior to that I got a last minute deal because the, the thing is you know if you if you can be flexible and I could I had the opportunity to go and um, get a last minute deal. So I paid probably a third of the price that, that most people would pay for a trip like that, uh, being a backpacker and saving my money and wanting to travel everywhere. So that was a real bargain for me. And I say a bargain, it was a lot of money still. <laughs> um, so I took this trip, it was 13 days and it was two days to get to Antarctica and two days to get back. So you're in the strait and you're, you're uh, chopping and changing and uh, it, I mean it was a phenomenal trip uh, absolutely stunning landscape we stayed on on the boat so we didn't you know we didn't experience that uh, <laughs> the system that you mentioned earlier <laughs> uh, we stayed on the boat we took zodiacs and we mostly went to islands off Antarctica one of the one of the days we went to one of the peninsulas uh, we saw a lot of penguins, we saw a lot of other kind of wildlife and the landscape and the icebergs, like I've never seen anything like it. For me, it was a total once in a lifetime trip. 
I probably will never go back, but I'm so glad that I went at least once. That's incredible. Um, yeah, I don't know that I'll ever get a chance to go to Antarctica. So that's that's a pretty unique experience, I imagine. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you are the host of the Happier at Work podcast. Um, is that your full time job? Tell me a little bit about what it is you spend your uh, working hours on. That is a really great question. I'm trying to figure that out myself. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, it's not my full time job. It is part of my wider business. And I, I set up my business nearly two years ago now. I left my corporate role about three years ago. Um, and when I set up my business, I set up as a coach uh, with a view to doing some consulting as well. So mm -hmm. I set up my business. I called myself Empowerment Coaching. Uh, focusing on workplace, focusing on women, that kind of thing. And I had in the back of my mind, because I was doing a master's in organizational behavior, I had in the back of my mind that I wanted to do some consulting as well. And with everything that happened last year and me still doing the master's and having to complete my dissertation mm -hmm. in lockdown, which wasn't a lot of fun. Um, let me tell you that, you know, working <laughs> in my bedroom without access to the library, everything had to be done online, oh, wow. you know, wow. uh, my meetings with my supervisor were all through Zoom. And um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the ideal scenario, but I got through it and I got a really great result and I'm really, really pleased with how it went. Um, but towards the end of last year, I decided to rebrand the business. I was originally going to use a different name, but I decided mm -hmm. to put everything under the same name as the podcast, which is Happier at Work. And I suppose for me, I spend my time doing everything that there is to do within the business. And uh, mm -hmm. so I very innocently, when I, when I first set up my business, very naively thought, um, okay, so if, I, if I'm doing coaching, then how many hours are there in a week? How much can I charge per hour? Wow, well, I'm going to be a millionaire in a few years time. This is great. This is a great business. <laughs> I neglected to consider everything else that needs to be done in business, which is, yeah. uh, you don't, you know, if you're working in a corporate role, you don't, you have no idea what else needs to be done. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if there's any IT problems that happen, as I mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. Um, when my disc regularly fills up and trying to trying to figure out how to reduce that or any issues like that, the marketing, the business development, the networking, the relationships that you need to build. Uh, at the moment, it's just me doing all of those things. Right. And I suppose the the ultimate aim or the vision is to create happier workplaces because of some of the experiences that I have had at work. And you know, it's I, I at one stage I, I I sort of had a tagline like making the world a happier place one workplace at a time. That's and beautiful. if you think of it like that, it is with every workplace that I can have an impact on, I'm making some sort of change. Um, I spend a lot of my time doing speaking, uh, getting paid for speaking engagements. I also do consulting around change. I have a happier at work program. And as you mentioned in the intro, I love data and research. That's my background. I, I worked in the market research industry in the fast moving consumer goods or consumer packaged goods, as it's called in the States. Uh, so anything that you buy in the supermarket, mm -hmm. I was able to analyze shopper behavior around those kind of things. So super interesting. But I got to a stage where that wasn't really my purpose anymore. And I'm much more aligned with creating better work environments for kind of more purpose-driven businesses. Um, so uh, yeah, basically I'm not just the podcast host. I do everything in the business. So whether that's coaching, consulting, the marketing, all the background stuff as well. So yeah. Perhaps that's why we had so much to talk about on your show is because we're like, you're, I'm the Oregon version of the Dublin U. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, we wear these similar hats and we consult in similar ways. I'm really glad that you brought up the level of work that's involved in going out on your own as a consultant and coach, because I think um, particularly in the last year, as people have moved home, they've thought greatly about how do I leave my corporate role and go into business for myself. And I think, you know, you really have to weigh uh, the benefits and the drawbacks of both. Being your own boss yeah. is great, but sometimes it means you're putting in actually 
more hours because you've got to wear yeah. so many hats. So Definitely, it can be yeah, a yeah. lot of effort. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of different things or a couple of different ways to look at that. So if you're putting in more hours, but it's something that you really love and you're much happier yeah. doing it, then it doesn't feel like work and you're actually OK. On the other hand, there's this idea that like most people who leave their jobs to set up their own business do it for what they say is freedom and flexibility. <laughs> and that's certainly something I thought. And now yes. if I look at how I spend my time, well, you know, maybe this is an exceptional year given that we're in lockdown at the moment, but how much time I spend on the business is not really the level of freedom that I anticipated by running my own business, you know? So it's it's mm -hmm. finding that balance between, and I hate using the word balance. Um, I think uh, I spoke to someone on the podcast recently and she just talked about it as uh, life harmony. So it's not even work life mm. harmony. It's just life harmony and how everything in your life integrates with each other in a harmonious way. Um, so, yeah, thinking thinking about that from lots of different perspectives, I think, is important. Yeah, I think I think it's incredibly um, interesting how uh, if when you if you're the type of person who feels overworked in your corporate job, there is a there is a strong chance that you will feel overworked working for yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. Um, and it may not be because of the job. And it's something yeah. you know. It's one of those things mm -hmm. where you have to take a look at your own habits of thought and your own patterns of behavior. Own, yeah, as you, absolutely. Wherever you your are. own beliefs. Yeah, yeah. The story that you're living inside. Absolutely. I'm always busy. And this is, I think this is a story that I probably lived inside for a long time. And I, if someone asked to meet up, you're like, oh, I'm quite busy. Or they see me posting stuff on social media all the time. They think, mm -hmm. oh, wow, she's really busy. And so they either don't get in touch or they get in touch and say, you're probably busy, but blah, 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 blah. This is what's happening. Um, so it's a, it's a story I'm certainly trying to move away from and focus more on, yes, I had a productive week. I didn't have a busy week because you can be busy doing stuff that's not really adding anything to your right. life or not adding anything to your business, but you can be productive and get stuff going and move the dial towards well, what is it that you're trying to achieve this year or this week or this quarter or whatever, whatever it is yeah. that you're looking at. Absolutely. I often say um, if you could just accomplish one thing and feel like you'd really accomplish something today what would that one thing be and then make sure you get that one thing done and the rest of it if it can wait then let it wait um and i i find that for myself it can be one of those things where um because i have a list of things that i need to do at some point i'll try and get them all done as quickly as possible yeah. thinking that that's going to save me time later but what actually happens is then i'm just constantly doing a long list of things every day because i just make a <laughs> brand new list so yeah. anytime i get a reminder from the universe like a power outage or losing internet um or uh even even the less wonderful things in that which those are bad enough but then you can also experience tragedy or urgency mm. around something that pulls you away from work and to discover that your work will still be there yeah. when you come back yeah it's, it's a great reminder that if you just get that one thing done um you know then that's you're all doing that great means. yeah yeah absolutely 100 yeah. percent agree and you're so right and i think one of the the things i've realized is that and this doesn't just apply to entrepreneurs or people who who run their own business yeah this applies to everyone you will always yeah. be busy you will always find something to do <laughs> I find it very strange when someone says to me I'm so bored or what should I do now like to me I'm like <laughs> you're bored I can give you a bit of work to do if you're bored you know I find it a very unusual circumstance like for me there's always something to do I love it when somebody says they're bored because I do give them things to do. It's wonderful. <laughs> I had a wonderful marketing relationship with somebody for three months because they were bored enough that they were like, let's try some stuff together um, and let's put a time limit on it. Now that um, they're off, you know, looking for other things to do, they're like, I guess I can't just do things for fun anymore. And I was like, I think you can. I think you should. Yes. But, um, you know, it was great. I was like, I'm so excited that you're bored. I've got stuff. Um <laughs> So, well, so speaking of the stories that we tell ourselves, I'm curious, 
what your perspective is on this idea of change when you hear um, change and big changes, particularly since you actually do some consulting in this uh, mm. in business. What what comes to mind for you? What's sort of what are your thoughts about change? Easy, hard, not a big deal. It's constant. How do you define it? Yeah, I think it's it's hard and it's constant. That's probably <laughs> what I what I think about it. Um, I think I'm the personality type that doesn't really welcome change, but also aware that it's it's happening all of the time around us. And I think as human beings, and again, this is something that I don't fully understand when someone else doesn't have that same approach that I do. For me, it's you're constantly evolving and learning and growing in self-awareness and therefore changing as a result. And if the people around you aren't on that same sort of trajectory or same journey as you are, then it can make things quite difficult. But for me, change is sort of, it's an evolution, it's constantly happening, and it can be quite hard. So considering that it feels hard to you, which is exciting to me, because uh, so many guests are attracted to come on the show who are like, change is just, it's just part of humanity. And it's beautiful and it's an evolution <laughs> um it's exciting to hear someone be like no you know what <laughs> it happens often so we have to deal yeah. with it but it kind of sucks um yeah. what are some of the things that you have found to be helpful in processing particularly challenging changes great question um and something i've got into in the last number of years has been meditation and journaling specifically and i know uh, journaling is something that I, let's say I shy away from, that I don't do it as often as I feel that I should do it. And I spent um, some time yesterday. And the thing with journaling is it's great because you can spend five minutes and be like, oh, I really feel great because I've downloaded all of that stuff out of my head. And so yesterday I went in with the intention of spending maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. I think it was about 10 to six. And I was like, oh, I should wrap up at around six o'clock with this. And I just kept writing and writing and writing. And I was still going at about 6.30. And I just felt great after it. You know, I just was able to process stuff. And it's also, the thing is, it's stuff that's going on for you. And for me, it's about raising your own self-awareness. So mm -hmm. um you know, in this case, it was about someone else and my relationship with that other person, but it was about me processing what's going on for me. What are the triggers that are coming up for me? What, what is this bringing up? What does this remind me of that has happened in the past? So that's, that has really, really helped me. That's a great tip. I, um, I relate to that as well. Uh, when I, uh, when my first marriage came to a close, I processed it through journaling and I found this it was a blog post online at the time um, that listed the questions you should answer for yourself to process the loss of a relationship, whether through death or, or through breakup. And mm. it was an incredibly helpful process. But what was particularly helpful was months later when memories get fuzzy and all of a sudden you only remember the good things and you start to lament you know, like, oh, did I make a mistake? I was able to refer back through this journaling process and look uh -huh. yeah. at, at what was happening in that moment and go, oh, yeah, mm. <laughs> no, I remember now. No, we're good. <laughs> we're, <this> is, <laughs> you know, we're right where we to, need to be. <laughs> yeah, it's good. We're good. We're good. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to have those things to, to refer back to. I think Definitely. that's a wonderful tip. Yeah. Um, is there a particular process that you follow when you journal? No, <laughs> honestly, no. Um, I think I'm the kind of person who has a tendency to overcomplicate things. So for me, the simplest is to sit down and write. And what I did notice yesterday was there was a lot of um, thinking and processing mm -hmm. of thinking rather than mm -hmm. feeling. And as I moved into more towards the feelings and I probably still have more stuff to do on that this evening, I would love to do some more exploring around that. Um, it was very kind of fact based and this happened and then that happened and <laughs> he said this and I said this and da, 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 you know, kind of going through that. Um, so I don't use a, a process. I am aware that there are other, you know, like what you, you mentioned about the blog post, there are things available that will give you a prompt. 
And mm-hmm. it's funny, in some ways, I'm a very ordered and structured person. And in some ways, I would love to have a journal that has those prompts in it. Mm-hmm. My fear around having something like that is that I'll run out of space or either the space <laughs> will be too big or too small, you know. Yes. So I like the idea of having that prompt. But maybe if you could fill out your own question and, and then go on to it. Um, And having said that, actually, and I just remember this now, I was using some prompts from a friend of mine and uh, she was posting on her Instagram every day for, I think, 30 days. She would post a journal prompt Mm -hmm. just to get you thinking and thinking about yourself and reflecting on what's going on for you, especially in the pandemic. And I found that really useful because similarly there could be some days where you're like okay you know and you you only write a little bit but actually there's other days then you're like whoa okay so this is starting to bring up some stuff for me let's keep writing let's keep going with this and let's explore it a bit a little bit further so prompts I think can be really useful but for the purposes of keeping it simple oftentimes Mm -hmm. I just write what's going on that makes sense to me um yeah I've I, that's a 30 days of prompts. That's a generous gift. I think that's, that's yeah, a really yeah. cool idea. It's a really yeah, cool idea. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. No, really enjoyed it. Um, well, I'm curious. I'd like to shift gears just a bit. Um, I've been trying out a new segment and and uh, I've said that it's on like every recording. So I don't know how new it is anymore, but I keep saying it's new. I ask you a bunch of rapid fire questions and you answer them as quickly as possible. And uh, I just really scary. like, <laughs> I know, right? And I just really like the simplicity of a title that tells you exactly what you're going to get. Um, but uh, I don't have cue cards for this. So rapid fire may be subjective. Um, yeah, yeah. Are you game? <laughs> The game of Aiden asks you a bunch of questions and you answer them as quickly as possible. I'm game. Yeah. Let us begin. Here is uh, question number one. Uh, Furniture has a home forever or rearranging the furniture is great. Oh, uh, rearranging. Rearranging for sure. Yes. I have. I live in a small flat at the moment and I have rearranged it for, I've been here for nearly two years and I've rearranged the furniture I think three times in that time period trying to find exactly how things work and how to get flow in in my little living space so yeah rearrange for sure nice okay if you had to pick one favorite item of clothing forever that you only ever but it's your favorite but it's like the yeah. same one forever or yeah. um, a new flashy outfit every day um, but you never get to wear the same thing twice. Which one do you pick? Oh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's also another tough question, isn't it? You don't make this easy, Aiden. Um, <laughs> I would say I'm not that big into fashion, so I think I'd have to pick a favorite and wear that every day, and that'd be my signature. That's my signature, signature outfit there. Me. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite? book that you've read in the last six months I read last year in 2020 I read 58 books what? yeah uh, I read before bed every night I listen to audiobooks when I go out walking as well and I have physical books and I have ebooks and I have kindle books and lots and lots of different books one of my favorite books I think from last year was the um uh, shoe dog which is the story of nike i just you know i don't necessarily associate with the brand i don't necessarily buy the trainers or anything like that sneakers kicks whatever the kids are yeah, calling sneakers, them these days kicks, running we shoes. call them we call them runners we call runners. them runners here in ireland yeah um but the the story really inspired me because it was the story of how he got started and at so many points like he they basically weren't making any money for a long long time they weren't taking salaries I think for quite a while uh, it, it tells a story of the relationships that he built the relationships that broke down I mean business relationships here and how they they were growing so rapidly that they they had to reinvest all of the money that they were making in sales back into the business to grow it, to keep up with the level of growth. And they nearly went bankrupt on so many different occasions. And it's just 
for me, it's such an inspirational story of starting with one person and growing into this. Like there's kind of, it sort of finishes, I think, in the in the 80s. So, you know, Mm -hmm. probably around the time when I would have become aware of Nike. And, you know, so it's obviously skips a huge chunk between then and now. But it's just, I just found it so inspirational how it goes from this this one man into this giant global corporation. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of client work with Nike, so um, I'm familiar with the story, even though I haven't read the book. And it is interesting to have a sense of how those roots have affected the longer tail of the way yeah. the company continues to operate. It's been very interesting, and I've seen them through some transition points as well. Yeah. Um, it's been interesting. Um Okay, last question. Travel restrictions, COVID restrictions, uh, everything yeah. is lifted. Yeah. It's as if it never happened. Who's, <laughs> if somebody waves a magic wand and the virus yeah. is gone. Um, who is the first person that you call up for a lunch that you know you're going to give them a hug when you see them? Um, and why? Oh, that's a great question. I think immediate answer is because at the moment we're in lockdown and we're restricted to five kilometers and so like three mile radius around our house and my parents actually live further away than that so as soon as I can they will be the first people that I will but I thought you were going down that road with a some sort of a where would you go travel wise anywhere in the world travel wise I had intended to go to Paris Mm -hmm. after I finished my dissertation obviously I couldn't go anywhere so Paris is definitely up there on the list further afield I would love to go to Alaska that is very high up on my list if it was to see a person and that person who I haven't seen in years uh, my friend lives in New Zealand so I would absolutely love to visit her and give her a hug and have lunch and I know in Australia and New Zealand it's all but gone at this stage so phenomenal job yeah um, well, thank you for playing the game. Aiden asks you a bunch of questions and you try to answer them as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, there's something interesting that showed up for me in listening to your answers, which is that um, for a person who finds change to be hard, you are drawn mm. to changes for um, lots of travel. You're drawn to yeah. rearranging the furniture. The one exception was mm. that favorite item of clothing. Um, ah. you know, the main pick yeah. uh, so it's I find it interesting there's always this balance for people um, we crave stability and we crave variety in some yeah. amount and the scales tip in different ways for different people and so it's always interesting to see where the scales tip for, for the folks who come on my show so thank you for playing <laughs> I loved it great great fun <laughs> <laughs> Um, Well, I've invited you here to share a story of a pivotal moment or a fork in the road moment from your own life, um, after which things changed in a noticeable way for you. And I wonder if you'd be willing to share that story now. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so for me, it happened when I was 27 years old, so about 15 years ago now. And for my entire life until then, I sort of thought... Uh, I always wanted to live in London like this was I'm from Dublin London is kind of the bigger city it's not too far away it's about one hour by plane and growing up and seeing I guess you know it's it's similar to what you see on on, on the TV uh, in the States you see New York and you see all these different cities but London it just had held a really uh, close place in my heart and my aunt lived there as well <clears throat> and I always wanted to do that and I talked about it all the time and when I was 27 I realized that I had been waiting for someone to grab me by the hand and say come on Aoife we're going to live in London you know I thought that this was what everyone wanted to do that everyone had the same aspirations as I did and the same kind of wants and desires for their life And it was kind of a wake up call then when I realized that not everyone wants the same things. And if I want to do something, then I'm going to have to do it myself and make it happen. So I did. I quit my job in Dublin and I moved over to London. Um, I moved in March in 2004 and uh, 
I haven't looked back since then, let's say. So that was kind of, that spurred me on to this new life of adventure of not waiting around for other people to decide what they want to do, but to, to kind of make very clear decisions for myself in my life of what I want to do, what, what I want to get out of it and be able to do that by myself. So when I moved to London, I moved by myself. Um, I made friends there and I had some friends who already lived there as well, which was great. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a pivotal moment. And it was, it was like, I always reflect back on that time in my life and I think that's I feel like that's kind of when my life began you know is mm. maybe a bit of a late bloomer at 27 but I feel like that's really when my my life began yeah I'm trying to imagine this moment where were you so when when you were do you remember you're having this think was there something that inspired that that moment I I don't remember exactly what inspired it, but I remember thinking if I want to make this happen, I'm going to have to do it myself. Um, you know, other people are not interested in the same things that I'm interested in. They're not talking about the same things. It could be prompted by, you know, my friends are starting to settle down a little bit and, um, you know, looking at buying houses, getting engaged, that kind of thing. And I thought, oh, that's, I'm not ready for that. I want to, I want to live a little bit first. I want to go to London. Uh, I want to travel, all of that kind of thing. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> I love, I love, I love that, that, that realization that if you wanted to make the move, you, you'd had to just make the move. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, I suppose it's more than that. It's that maybe not everyone is like this, but I certainly thought that, that, I assumed that other people had the same wants for their life. You know, I have this picture of what my life will be like or, or what I want to do, or what I want to achieve. And other people didn't have that same picture for themselves. So they didn't think, well, wouldn't it be amazing to live in London, even just for a year? Um, but what that also prompted was, so I lived in London for three and a half years. I hadn't intended to stay so long, but I enjoyed it so much that I stayed. and. Subsequent to that, I traveled around Southeast Asia for six months. I lived in Australia for two and a half years and I traveled all around Australia. I traveled around New Zealand by myself. Um, and on my way home from Australia, I traveled around the States. And South, that's when I had my South America trip as well. So I did all of that by myself. I wasn't waiting around for anyone else to kind of prompt me to do it. it, it I just felt like it was scary, but I did it anyway. That's lovely. Um, of those travels, what was the favorite place that you visited? Oh, uh, that's it's so hard, I think, to, to pick one place. But one place that definitely stands out for me is Patagonia uh, in between kind of Chile and Argentina, or, you know, doing loads of hiking, uh, beautiful scenery, great hikes and awesome people there who are you know they're there to to do the hikes and stuff as well so that is definitely a place that that stands out for me uh I absolutely loved it and would go back there in a heartbeat definitely what do you think would have happened to your life if you had not had that thought if you waited for somebody to take you by the hand oh wow <laughs> I'd still be in Dublin wait a minute I am in Dublin <laughs> um I think yeah, if I if I hadn't thought that, I probably uh, I would still be in Dublin. I would I might still be in the same job. Um, I certainly wouldn't feel so independent as I do now. And yeah, I think I'd be maybe a bit more of a sheep and following what other people want to do and not able to stick up for myself as much. Um. But yeah, really great question. It's like a sliding doors moment. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, it's like a spark. I, I can't remember who it is. I was listening to a, um, uh, is Sam, Sam Harris. I was listening to a book by Sam Harris recently. And he talks about um, the, like, the two brains in a way. We have these conversations with ourselves. And where is this other voice even coming yeah. from? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. When we have a really the creative from, idea. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who had that idea? Where is that coming from? Yeah, yeah. 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 The idea happened to me. 
<laughs> right? It feels that way. I, you know, yeah. I hear people often talk about like, uh, you know, their feelings, their experiences, their ideas as if they've happened outside themselves, but in some sort of, they happen inside, but in some sort of way, Sam Harris may be onto something um, because it's like, there's this moment you just had this thought, this thought just like popped in. Yeah. If I don't go, no one else is necessarily going to take me. My interests aren't the same as everybody else that my interests mm. are my interests. Yeah. And, and that sparked everything else after that. I find that yeah. fascinating. Yeah. 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 And it's funny when I, when I told my friends, they were like, Oh, Wow. You've been talking about that for years. I'm surprised you didn't go sooner, you know, <laughs> as if this was the most natural thing in the world. And I'm kind of, I'm like, oh yeah, well, I'm really glad that you said that because I have been talking about it a long time. And I, I think I talked about it so much that I just assumed that other people were interested in doing what I wanted to do as well. And they weren't. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a good reminder. I think that, you know, it, it, it reminds me very much, actually, of the improv stage um, when performers are on the sidelines watching the players on stage perform a scene. Um, they'll have all sorts of thoughts pop in like, oh, why isn't that person doing this? Or somebody really ought to do that. And I always tell my improv students, when you have that thought that something should be happening, that somebody ought to make something happen, that somebody is you. Is you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> because because not nobody everyone else has is, those same thoughts. Yeah, nobody else is having yeah. those thoughts. Or somebody mm. might be. Um, you know, in an audience, the likelihood is that somebody in the audience is thinking the same way that you are because there's more people typically than on stage. Um, not always, depends on how far into your improv career you are. But um <laughs> <laughs> um but you know that instinct to um, move, letting your feet guide you. There's there's some wisdom there um, to taking those leaps with the realization that if I'm having that thought, then I guess I'm the one who needs to make that thought materialize if I yeah. want to see it happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I like that. <laughs> and the <laughs> the concept of a leap. Yeah, it's a, a total leap of faith. I went with no job lined up. I did some temping for a while. And then I got my job and I stayed in that job for three and a half years and I absolutely loved it. Uh, I won't say every minute of it, but I, I loved most of it. Really, really enjoyed it. Great bunch of people, lots of learning and, and stuff like that as well. So it was definitely worth it. That's wonderful. Well, as we bring this conversation to a gentle close, um, I'm curious what you would like to leave listeners with. What are your thoughts or wisdom or book recommendations that you'd like to share with people so I just finished last night reading a book called how women rise and I think everyone should read it not just women uh, it's targeted at, at women and those who want to see women succeed at work and to uh, move up through the levels it's by Sally Helgeson and Marshall Goldsmith so people might have heard of those people before um, I just finished reading that. It's all about the habits that women have at work that might sabotage their uh, moving or um, rising through the ranks, essentially. Mm. And it was a real eye opener for me. And definitely in my running my own business, there's some habits that are getting in the way there. But certainly I can relate to it in my corporate career as well. So that would be my book recommendation, just because it's it's uh, hot off the press, given that I just read it last night. Can you give um, an example of one one of the behaviors or habits that shows up that can be a little bit sabotage -y? Yeah. So one of them that they mention is, um, I can mention a few actually, because the ones that resonated particularly with me. So one of them is perfectionism, wanting everything to be really perfect, which when you it might get you to a certain level but then once you go beyond that level it can can, can turn into a type of controlling behavior where you have those same exacting standards of other people and people are reluctant then to uh, or you're reluctant to delegate uh, you spend too, way too much time doing the menial tasks that you don't necessarily need to do um, people don't put in as much effort because it has to go through you anyway. You're like the kind of the gatekeeper. You're the the uh, 
the blocker in the in the system um, so they don't do they don't put in as much effort and therefore they tend to yeah like the the, the work is poorer because they know you're going to correct it anyway <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and the other one is that women are really fantastic networkers and really great at building relationships but what we're not great at doing is leveraging those relationships mm-hmm. and so when a man has a business relationship it's it's much easier for men and this is a general statement this doesn't apply to everyone sure it's much easier for men to make those kind of business relationships um more fruitful and to ask for what they want and to be clear on what they can give in that relationship because it's it's reciprocal isn't it um but for women it's they don't want to be seen like they're using people. They don't want to be seen like they're taking advantage or that they don't really want this personal friendship. They have, they build great personal friendships and and business relationships, but they don't necessarily turn it into business. So I thought that was very interesting as well. Um, That's intriguing. So then the behavior change there uh, would be to get really practiced at asking for what you want and need and being clear about what the exchange would be. So like someone within your network, for example, that might be able to help to introduce you to that company where you could potentially do the work. Yeah. And then what do you, being really clear about what you have to offer in, in that relationship, what does that other person need and how can you help them? And it doesn't have to be immediate, but, but I suppose the idea being that over time, it's, it's a constant exchange of, I can help you. And I don't like saying this, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, but it's that type of scenario. Um, But really, really interesting because it's so true. Women are great at building relationships, but then like, what do they actually get from those business relationships specifically? Interesting. Um, Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. Um, In terms of parting thoughts, I think the, the overall theme of what I've been talking about has been this idea of if you want to do something, just go and do it, make it happen. Um, you are the person who is in control of your own life. Don't wait around for other people. Be really clear on what it is that you want and, and go and get it. Those are wonderful parting thoughts. Thank you <laughs> so much, Eva. I have really enjoyed having you on the show. Uh, we'll put links in the show notes for ways to find you, the books that we discussed. Um, and, uh, and I just want to thank you so much for your time and your thoughts today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely loved it. It was great fun, great energy. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Aiden. I think the biggest takeaway from my conversation with Eva today is when it comes to life and the experiences we have and the adventures that we go on, it's wise to remember that we do, you do, have a say in how that turns out. And I think that it can be really easy to forget that. I mean, particularly during a time when the world is rapidly changing around us, and when even companies are reevaluating how work is supposed to work, mindset and our stories about what we're capable of creating or not creating for ourselves play a role, certainly. But ultimately, when it comes to taking action, that's just up to you. The old expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink brings to mind. Look, I will acknowledge that taking first steps on a new path, they're not always as obvious to identify as I want to go to London, so I'm going to quit my job and buy a ticket, go to London. So sitting down, taking stock, doing some journaling can be really helpful. A moment of framing your thinking can be invaluable when it comes to picking direction. Hey, if you want help with that, call me. I am happy to help you do that. There will be links per usual in the show notes for this episode at thechangedpodcast.com. If you have a job, run a company, lead a team, own your own business, or plan to do any of those things in the future, I cannot recommend enough that you listen to the Happier at Work podcast. Thank you to Eva O'Brien for being here today and sharing her thoughts and stories. Special thanks go to my family for their love, support, and patience. To all of you, of course, for listening. And to all of the amazing Changed Podcast Patreon page members, who I couldn't do this without, the Art of Change Skills for Life, and Patreon member producer, Dr. Rick Kirshner. 
I'm Aidan Nepom, and I wish you the kind of experiences in life you're excited to tell stories about. <laughs>